thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker all the way from London, um, Tanvir Hassan. Tanvir is deputy chair, lead director for the London office of Donald Insel Associates, which is one of the older and more established architectural conservation practices in the United Kingdom with offices positioned throughout the UK and it's over 100 employees strong. Donald Insel Associates is not just a thriving architectural conservation practice, but also one that recently nurtured one of our um, very own Roger Williams graduates, Eliza Ross, who sadly passed away nearly a year ago, but whose memory uh, is one of the reasons we're gathered here tonight for Tumbeer's talk. Um, Tumbeer is a graduate of the Architectural Association uh, School of Architecture in London and the University of Oxford. Um, and as a conservation architect, um, she's been involved with the restoration of some of uh, England's most iconic buildings, such as Christopher Wren's Greenwich Hospital, perhaps better known as the old Royal uh, Naval Colleges at Greenwich, and Pugin's Palace of Westminster, also known as the Houses of Parliament, among others. Tambir has worked in Pakistan, Egypt, and England, and has, some especially, is, has become especially interested in the re regeneration of historic fabric. She strongly believes that old buildings should continue to be used and experienced by current and future generations, and her talk today is a case study of one such project in London. So with that, please welcome Tambir Hassan. Um. I'd like to, before I begin my talk, um, just um, mention Elisa, who was uh, a graduate of Roger William, and who um, passed away last year after having worked with us for five years, almost. She came as um, an architect and uh, rose to the position of an associate. She was an exceptionally bright and able person, and we sorely miss her. Um, and we are hoping to set up a scholarship with Roger Williams um, for uh, travel to uh, England um, for students of the preservation or architecture um, at, at this university. Donald and Associate, uh, to those of you who do not know, is, um, is an old established firm. It was set up in 1958 by Sir Donald Insel. And we, um, are, as architects and town planners, with a particular interest in conservation, we are an employee-owned trust with just over 120 members. We have branches throughout England, and as you can see from this picture, um, we have a large number of female. In fact, we are over 50% women. Um, so we are a, a special firm in that respect. Our work um, is largely, um, we work largely on palaces, country houses, we've worked on Windsor Castle after the fire, we work at the House of Parliament, we have work at the Tower of London. Um, this, is, this is the House of Parliament. Um, we do uh, work at Buckingham Palace and our portfolio also includes a large number of the great estates who are major developers in, in the City of London, and that is what I will be talking about uh, in more details. But Hassan and Nate insisted that I should put some of our projects in, so I'm just going to rush through some that I have put up on the screen. This is um, the King's Observatory. This is King George III's Observatory at Kew. It was built in uh, six, uh, 1768 for the uh, transit of Venus. It was a little folly for, uh, for King George, provide, built by his mother. Next to her palace, and it is being converted uh, to a, a private residence. Uh, this is a house, a grade one listed building in central London to which we have added an extension. Uh, we done, we've done our share of uh, museums, and this is a little museum um, uh, in Clerkenwell. It is a, um, a, a, a Jacobean building. Um, and this is a, uh, a development, office development um, in central London again. It is an Edwardian building. Uh, it was a, a, um, 
a hospital which was extended and has now become part of a large office building. These are uh, baths in um, in Bath. This is the cross baths, uh, which was uh, uh, is regenerated as an active bath. Um, and this is a house in the north, which was a ruin and has been uh, regenerated as a, a residence. Uh, this is again um, a, a country house, and which uh, these are all listed. In other words, they are on the on the preservation uh, list. And it was uh, it was extended with a swimming pool and uh, additional accommodation. These are the walls of Chester. They are um, uh, Roman walls which were completed in the 12th century, and we have regenerated them as a uh, as an active tourist wall uh, with the local community. So they have little moments of interest, and you can walk around them. We do our share of monuments throughout London. So we have uh, the Queen Mother. We have uh, the Battle of Britain, which was uh, added to um, uh, event of the London Tube. Which you see above and the Battle of Britain below. We have recently put up Nelson Mandela on uh, in uh, Westminster uh, uh, Parliament Square. We also do new buildings, and this is uh, Steve Haw Stephen Hawkins building in Cambridge. And these are more details of the same. Uh, this is a more recent project. It is the Copper Bins, which is a new structure which was uh, developed to as a museum for uh, the copper mining in. In, uh, in Wales. But the main thrust of my talk is on Regent Street, which is uh, which is a street which um, you may or may not know. It is uh, one of the major uh, streets, uh, major shopping street. It is one of the earliest designed boulevard, as it were, inverted commas, in central London. It is a, a late, an early 19th century, build, and it sort of stretches across. So I will be talking about this street. This is Piccadilly Circus, in case, uh, just to give you a, a position. And I'll be talking about this building. So this street, which sort of stretches across, and then that little building, uh, which is the one that I'll be uh, discussing in some more detail. So Regent Street is a street uh, that stretches from, from this area, which is Regent's Park, and it goes across and, and ends up here. It was a street that was designed to link this park with the palace of George IV, which was Carlton uh, House Palace, which, sit, which sat here. And uh, it's a it's a it's a palace that George uh, had inhabited for 36 years, and um, and then he had demolished as he moved into Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace is 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 um, can you see it? It's sort of around here. So Regent Street, as I was saying, is owned uh, by the Crown Estate. London, as you can see from this map, is divided between the Great Estates. The Great Estates were given to these people uh, initially by Henry VIII when he dissolved the monasteries and he gave parcels of land to his friends and family. And uh, at that time, they were just parcels of land, which were grazing lands, and they were gradually developed largely in the 18th century into uh, urban um, accommodation. And the way the system worked is that uh, an area was laid out around a square with houses. and. Um, the, the, the estate would then give away those houses to individual developers for a very nominal sum. The developer would put the building up to an overall design given to them by the estate. He would sell it and make profit. And the estate would then agree a lease with the end holder. And after 100 years, the, the estate would come back to, the, the property would come back to the estate and they would lease it again. And so, so the Crown Estate, as you can see, owns a piece of land, which is, which is Regent's Park, and it owns a parcel of land around here, which is where Carlton House is. And they wanted to put up a, a street which would connect the two so that it would develop this area, which was rather poor, and it would uh, extend the regeneration of this land, which belonged to the Portland Estate, and it had already been regenerated. Uh, and this is Regent's Park, and this is what the Portland Estate had developed. So they uh, came up with a scheme uh, to, to, to design a street, a shopping street, um, which would, uh, which would 
bring them some money, but which would also connect uh, Regent's Park to the palace of George IV. And they chose uh, for that purpose, uh, so this is this is again the same map, and you can see the Regent Street, which they had they had developed, had to circumvent all of these other properties. So it had to swirl. It 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 made, no longer was a straight street. It was a street that did sort of curves and and circumvented around uh, various property. It 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 missed uh, Oxford Circus. Oxford Street wasn't such a great street. It swerved around the property of Lord Langham because he wouldn't sell his estate. It curved around uh, and formed a quadrant because these people would, wouldn't sell theirs. And so the street kind of stretched. It took a course according to the, the property, um, uh, according to where they could put, the, uh, uh, put their, their layout. And the, the, the job, the architect who got the job was John Nash. And this was this was odd, because uh, Nash had in 1798 married a young lady called Marianne, and Marianne was the mistress of George IV, as you can see from the picture above, and she came with a retinue of children, uh, whom. Uh, it is assumed, who were never paid for by, by John Nash. So it is assumed that George the Fourth and John Nash had a kind of an arrangement. But be that as it may, Regent Street was laid out, and very successfully so. It was basically a design, um, it, it, they, he gave a, a design concept, so he laid out the facade, this is what they would look like, and individual architects would design the buildings for shop, with shops at the bottom and accommodation at the top, but the street also included um, churches, it included um, theaters and, and concert halls, etc. So successful was Regent Street that by the end of the 19th century, those buildings had been extended upwards and uh, and and sideways and every which way they could because it was very very popular so much so that in the towards the end of the 19th century when um, when the quadrant, which is that little corner, came for development, uh, the the um, local authority had to consider very, very carefully who to give this job of um, of designing to the design uh, guidelines to, and they chose an old uh, architect called Norman Shaw. Norman Shaw designed uh, a, a building, but he also designed um, and. But by that time, the the the, the developer, the the local um, shopkeepers were so uh, powerful that they objected. Um, uh, and one of the things they objected to was the colonnade that was uh, initially sort of designed to go around it. They said that the colonnade was um, obscured. The the uh, their shoppers they couldn't see the wares. That there was loitering going on in the street. And so the Crown Estate, being a very clever developer, said. Right. Okay. Well, we'll get rid of this arcade. And and the point that I'm making is that Regent Street, uh, when it was redeveloped in the early 20th century, which is the first time the leases fell in, really took the form it did because the shopkeepers and the users of the street wanted it to look like that. And so it had. It was a. It was designed as a tall street with a particular. Um, a stone finish, and it uh, to the design largely of uh, Reginald Bromfield, and you see one of his. Uh, but it is more or less a kind of homogenous. It has a design guide, and everybody does their own thing. But basically, the street looks homogenous. Side streets are similarly. When the Crown Estates um, uh, leases fell again at the beginning of the 21st century, they couldn't do what the, the Crown had done previously, because by the time they got the buildings, they were listed. That means they couldn't really change them. Uh, so they called upon us, Donald and Associate, to help them 
as uh, the conservation we designed, a conservation plan, which uh, basically looked at each building and it said, you've got to keep this, but you can get rid of this because this is peculiar and special, this is not that special, there's many more of these. And so a, a kind of, on a, on a building by building basis, we gave them a guideline of what they could pull down, what they could keep, how much they had to change. And now Regent Street has developed into a, a really successful and active um, shopping street. It has, uh, it has uh, the Apple shop, it has some sort of high-end retailers, it has some really swishy residential on the side street where, uh, um, you know, expensive people buy expensive houses and so on and so forth. But the building that Along the uh, one of the, the the buildings that was causing a lot of uh, problems in terms of its uh, of its position is is this block, which is known as the region was known as the Regent Palace Hotel, and it lay at the end of the quadrant. It wasn't a listed building. It was in the middle of a, um, a quite a tight corner. It was an island site. It uh, this whole area had fallen into to sort of ruin and it needed uh, it needed regeneration and the crown appointed an architect who said well the only way you can do this building is to demolish it and build a new structure and the moment they said that the the local um, amenity societies and the local um, uh, residents were up in arms and the building was put on the preservation register i.e. it was listed and Therefore, they could do nothing but to uh, look to us to help them out. And we worked with uh, Jeremy Dixon, who was the architect, uh, to come up with a plan. The Regent Palace Hotel uh, was built in 1910. It's, uh, it was built by uh, JJ Lyons, who were uh, restaurateurs, and they provided us uh, restaurants and um, in the food industry to all classes of people, so the very rich and the very poor. So they knew where the market was. And the Regent Palace Hotel was designed not for the upper echelon, it was required for the second tier of travelers. And it was a sister to the Strand Palace Hotel, which was for the higher end uh, um, um, travelers. And London had a lot of travelers. There were a lot of uh, trains. There were a lot of people moving about. There were boats. They were traveling, and it was needed. And so this hotel was uh, developed in a Beaux-Arts stride, sort of very, all the mod cons it had. And for its facade, it used a new technology, which is the glazed uh, ceramic and terracotta. The building uh, had um, a wonderful, glamorous uh, uh, lobby, but it was basically glamour on a budget because it had a thousand rooms, but the U shared a bathroom. It didn't. It didn't have en suite, and it had a, uh, a winter garden with a dome, um, with designed by the Bromsgrove Guild. It had very high uh, quality material, but only for the public areas. By the time uh, the building uh, was being looked at in the, uh, in the 20th century, so around 2004, 2005, the whole building had come to um, a, a rather sad stale. This, this, is, the, this is what the, the dome looked like. This is what the dome should have looked like. It had been divided up, and basically you could buy rooms by the hour at the Regent Palace Hotel. And one of the uh, one of the more important uh, uh, aspect of the architecture of the Regent Palace Hotel were rooms that were put uh, its dining rooms, which had been designed in the 1930s by an architect called uh, Oliver Barnard, and you see uh, uh, see these rooms. Uh, when the when the hotel was opened, they were described and and praised by the architectural uh, industry as naughty but uh, not vulgar. 
So they were really quite, uh, uh, quite wonderful uh, buildings. They used new material. They used um, different types of timber. They used formica. It was the first building that was lined in formica. They used the new type of lighting. They used coal cathode and incandescent lighting. They used really fancy um, uh, plaster work. Oliver Bonnard had been to America. He had worked on ships. He was a state set designer. And this building, in this building, he really display, displayed his skill to, to the you know, the utmost. The Regent Palace Hotel, as I said, had by the early, uh, by the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th, end of the 20th century, 2004, 2005, fallen into complete disrepair. You can see the uh, the ceramic tiles had beginning to fall, to, were beginning to fall off. The the streets were congested. The building was covered with neon lights. It was not in a very good state. And here it is again. It was all boarded up and blocked. The windows were falling to pieces. It was a difficult building to regenerate because it had very low ceiling heights. Whoops. It had very low ceiling heights. And the problem had been, the reason why it had, the first architect had said that they would demolish it is because it was impossible to put services. It was impossible to, to, to reuse it. And so then, we looked at the building quite carefully, and we analyzed. And we discovered that, actually, the, the importance of the building was its facade, but it was basically its urban views and its 1930s room. So a scheme was developed where you kept the, 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 the corners, which were your urban sort of points. And you kept your 1930s rooms. You moved the one room which was on the ground floor to the basement to accompany the other rooms which were already in the basement, forming a sort of a group of 1930s interiors and clear, clearing up the ground floor for development. And here you have a section showing you uh, the building with uh, an atrium in the middle and all the rooms which were to be conserved in the basement. Um, the ground floor itself was then developed and, and broken up into little sections. So this corner, which was retained, was turned into small offices. And it could do small offices with a low ceiling height. That corner, which again had low ceiling height, was converted into a residential unit. The rest became retail and connected to the street. And you had large scale offices. The building um, also had a large, uh, what we call loading bay. But I will come to that uh, later later on, and the rest of it were just offices with a uh, atrium in the middle, as I had described earlier. Work began on the site. On uh, Consent was given to the building in 2008 to go ahead, which is exactly when the Lehman brother fell. Um, uh, and so it was, it, it was developed at the height of the recession. And, um, and work began. By oops, as you can see, uh, the building, the center core of the building was taken down. Um, the rooms were con were uh, dismantled and moved out of sight. Those that were to remain were were preserved and protected, and the building um, started to be developed. When you put a building like this together, which has a combination of uh, a, a preserved bit and a new bit, one of the, the issues is always the, the junctions, the, the joints. The people who, uh, Dixon Jones, who were uh, designing the new building, used the same uh, fiance or the same ceramic maker as the, the one who was going to repair ours and the cold shores of Darwin. They're one of the few uh, firms that still produce uh, glazed ceramic tiles using the old technique, so you get this uneven glazing. and. Uh, but the tolerance levels are very different. The the the, the glazed uh, ceramic, which were oh, sorry, the glazed ceramic which were used, oh, sorry, which were used by Dixon Jones, were uh, manufactured in England, shipped to Brussels to be put on panels, then sent to Switzerland, who were then put onto their system, and then brought back to England and assembled. The tolerance levels of the original ceramic, the, the old ceramic, is about two to three inches. The 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 tolerance level of the Swiss-made uh, uh, ceramic was five millimeters. And uh, 
And these are the sort of differences that you get. The building that is old sitting on old footing moves differently. The building that is on new footing moves differently. And so junctions became a real concern of ours. And we had to detail that quite carefully. The ceramics themselves had, uh, which is the glazed faience, had itself deteriorated because they were also um, um, reinforced with, with um, iron, which was um, obviously rusting and blowing. And so these are the new, new ceramics which are manufactured. Uh, faience was developed uh, by the same people who made sinks. So basically, all the ceramics are like sort of big sinks. And they are filled with a light concrete, and then they are put up to form the details. And uh, here it is uh, going up onto the facade. So they are slightly self, uh, they can be sat on top of, they can take the weight, uh, but they still have to be uh, attached to the building. The, the lead work on the roof along, along with the, the fines, as you can see, was the other uh, external fabric that was conserved. And you can see the corner cartouches, which are lion cartouches um, in memory of J.P. Lyons, were, were clad in lead. They're made out of timber. And they were clad in lead. And these were very carefully dismantled, measured, um, a, a, a cast made of them in case we lost them and dropped them. And then, then they were recast with new lead. And here they are all sort of sitting in a, in a row. All the timber was preserved. You can see the old timber rows, which were put in underneath. So we used all the original timber, as much of it as we can, replacing only that which is necessary. And here they are being sort of put back onto the roof, new lead roofs. And, and here is the building with its corners uh, preserved and the main block uh, replaced. The um, Regent Palace Hotel is a Briam excellent building or lead gold star. It, it, it has a, uh, a, a power a fuel cell, and it provides energy to, to the buildings around it. It also has, as I said, a loading bay, which uh, connects to the other building so that you, you park your car here. There's a, you park your, your vehicle, which is offloading into this building, and through a tunnel, you can service all the, uh, the, the other, which meant that a lot of the the pedestrian, uh, a lot of the road traffic on narrow streets could be removed because these two buildings are now connected through a tunnel, and this could be pedestrianized. This is part of the 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 the, 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 the public realm, which was um, developed as as the building. The streets were therefore now, after the conservation of the main block, uh, are much more appealing. You have a wholesale retailer, and the building now connects, unlike the Regent Palace Hotel, which had no uh, presence on the street. The new building was regenerated with, with much more active um, street for us, uh, activities. And here it is again with uh, the combination of the old and new, with the fines were cleaned and repaired, and the new building inserted at the core of it. And more views of the same. The offices were uh, regenerated as uh, high-end offices, and Al Gore was one of the first to um, to, to rent a uh, an office there because of the green credential of the building. So um, the development comprised 180,000 square feet of grade A offices, six, 16,000 square feet of small office suites, nine residential apartments, 58,000 square feet of retail, and 44,000 square feet of public, enabling uh, 12,000 square feet of off-street off service yard, which is the service yard that I talked about. So by keeping the, the old fabric, what we had done is provided the Crown Estate with a building which would you know, just as, uh, as successful as a new block would have been, but, but evidently more attractive. And these are the, the old um, dining halls, which were also part of our conservation scheme. And the, these are the set. They were, they were divided into two units, one, uh, one set, which had three rooms, the shake up, the smoking bar, and the Atlantic, which I will return to, and the, and the, build, and the room that was brought down from the, from the ground floor, which is the Titanic bar. The, the, when Oliver Barnard had put the rooms together, which this is the Titanic, 
he had actually placed them on top of the existing Edwardian interior. So fortunately for us, we could dismantle them because he had just simply, they were like a sort of a, a, a kit of parts and he had just clamped them onto the, to the Edwardian interiors and they could then be disassembled and taken away and, and restored and put back, which is exactly what we did to them. They were very lush interiors, but when we, uh, when we received them, they looked like this. And we had to do careful paint analysis. We had to do research on the wood. This is, this is rosewood, and it's, uh, it, it's got brass details. It's got brass cornices. It has uh, um, corrugated uh, glass uh, panels which are lit at the back. It had embossed aluminium uh, veneers on top of bird's eye maple. It was quite a spectacular interior. And when we dismantled the, the building, we discovered that it had, the reason why it, it had fallen apart is that it had basic flaws. So the, so the embossed aluminium uh, veneers on top of the bird's eye were actually just pasted onto plaster. And of course, that just fell apart. Um, and we took it apart, took the, to the room apart, and we made some changes. So, so the, oops. The uh, columns uh, were taken away, and a new. Uh, this this is basically just telling this the engineer how big a column they could make. We had to insulate them, fire insulate the columns, and make them comply with 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 modern standards of uh, uh, regulations. And then they were reassembled. The the panels, the wall panels, we did not put plaster back on them. We changed the the d details to plywood and applied the veneer on top. Um, and this is uh, uh, the, a great, the, the profiles of the ceilings were taken in great detail because the ceiling had asbestos, we couldn't use it. And we were talking earlier, this process of uh, the, the scale of the operation, the, the restoration of the building alone was 20 million pounds. So when you are working on a scale like this, you can't use artisans, you have to use uh, uh, trades who have that kind of insurance, so they are big tradesmen, and they don't do uh, conservation. So part of what we did was to train their people how to do this. And this happens every so often. When we restored Windsor Castle 20 years ago, we there was a whole bunch of people that got trained and apprentices. And they were the apprentices that we used when we did Regent Palace Hotel 20 years later. And they trained a whole bunch of other apprentices with us. And this is basically how the system works. So projects of this scale are important, and um, and this is them putting back the 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 the, the, the Titanic uh, with its ceilings. Of course, on top of that, you can see that all the services are are in place, and the building is just the the rooms are just basically um, um, interiors which are clipped on. And here it is, all the details of the, uh, of the this. Um, glass which was specially cast, all the lights which were specially made, uh, the, chrome f the, the chrome finished finials and details where they were lost, they were recreated, uh, this crenellation. So there was a lot of new stuff and new training and, and wonderful material. And paint analysis uh, had told us the color of the Titanic. And despite everybody uh, objecting to these uh, these green colors we did put them on and when we lit it the way oliver barnard had expected it to be lit with two different types two different sources of light an incandescent and a cold cathode it really lit up very, very differently. Um, and it all made sense. Uh, and in, you can see how the, the domes were, were different and the edges were different. And you understand how lighting is an essential part of the whole interiors and, and colors have to be looked at in that sense. And the bird's eye maple made sense and you know it all sort of came together. But the Titanic was let to a, a restauranter that sells steaks. And they couldn't cope with the green color because the customers didn't want green colored meat. So they repainted the ceiling. And as you can see, it just lost it. Um, and these are the new ceilings painted in a kind of an off-white. Um, 
The other room that we looked at is called the Atlantic Bar, which I have pointed out to you. This is, it was an Edwardian interior. It had a link cluster, which is that heavily mottled uh, wallpaper around it, both on the ceilings and the walls. When Oliver Bonner did it up, he didn't really change much of it. It had breccia, which is like a pink marble on the on the columns, gilded uh, plaster uh, corbels, quite elaborate cornices. He simply removed the, the link cluster wallpaper and he painted the walls. Um, as we discovered through paint analysis, they were marble grained. And uh, he changed the lights. Again, this room by, the, the, uh, by 2004 had had changed completely. It looked like that. The lights were sort of made out of some plastic material. The the walls were very heavily painted. And again, the 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 the, the and this is what the room looked like. It was nothing like what our analysis of the material and our paint analysis was telling us, and our study of photographs was telling us. So the room was reassembled very carefully, and this is just a drawing showing how carefully you have to work out ceilings, and you have to discuss with the engineer where they can, how deep their beams can be. This building was taking all the offices above. It had not enough columns, so there were huge transfer beams. So all this is quite carefully um, uh, orchestrated. And uh, the elements of the room were, were uh, dismantled and they were sent to a workshop. It all has to be kept at temperature and humidity controlled, both the trucks that took the, 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 the timber away and the, um, uh, the workshop where it was being maintained. And uh, sort of very heavy uh, uh, restoration. We also convinced our client to use uh, 24 karat gold to gild their ceilings, which they, they did, as you can see. And uh, what they did is they bought more gold Gold uh, than they needed, and at the end of the job, they could sell the stuff they didn't, and they made a little bit of a profit on it. Um, and this is the room when it was reinstated, uh, and it is now one of the most successful restaurants on brasseries in London. Um, it uh, it uh, serves a thousand people a day, um, and it's uh, one of Jeremy King's, who is the restaurant uh, most successful brasseries. And this is. Um, what it looks like. The third uh, room which we, which I'd like to look at today is the Shake Up Bar, which is uh, one of the first uh, Formica-lined uh, interiors in London. And the Shake Up Bar, as you can see here, had completely disintegrated. In fact, it was nothing. There was no Formica left. And, and the question was, why did the Formica disintegrate? And of course, because the Formica built in, uh, made in the 1930s was very brittle. So it, it, um, it cracks, and it, it falls apart, and it chips. And, um, and it's quite difficult, unless you take the whole thing apart, it's quite difficult to replace it. So we had to come up with a, uh, a technique where we could get back the Formica, but, but uh, design it in a manner that the, the room could be dismantled and reassembled um, in case you needed to replace it. So it was, uh, and we, we had to also recreate it because we had photographs but when we had the room, but we really didn't know uh, what the, uh, the building looked like. And fortunately, Mr. Bonnard's drawings survive at the RIBA, so we looked at them very carefully. And here's the interiors of the shake-up, as designed by Oliver Bonnard. And, um, and we followed this very closely to recreate uh, the building, uh, the, the room, and including uh, these um, windows, which were the sort of the colored glass window. And to get, we, we did a lot of traveling for this, uh, uh, for this building. These, this glass comes from France. So uh, they, it comes from Saint-Gobain. So we went there and we looked at all the colored glass and we matched the ones we wanted. The marble comes from Italy. So that was, we went to Italy to source the marble that they needed. Um, uh, uh, and the the wood, a lot of the wood uh, that we used in this uh, uh, in this restoration uh, was no longer available because it was not um, uh, um, source. Uh, so we had to use matching material. And in the Atlantic, we had to use eucalyptus in, instead of Asian satin wood. But it's it's all part of the sort of the journey. Coming
coming back to Sheikha, so these are the columns in manufacture, and they, are, they were assembled off site, and then they were brought back and put um, into their context. They are made in, 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 in strips, so you can see they're made in little pieces, uh, which sort of clip on to, to one after the other, and they're tied by a, a metal um, brace, which you can just about see here. The floor as well was, was made uh, off-site and reassembled. It is a sort of a, a, a mosaic. We had to analyze each and every piece of timber because it has three different types of timber. And we had to source that so that we could get the color we wanted. These are the, um, the, the, the windows that were uh, assembled to, to Oliver Barnard's uh, design. This light was also made to his, uh, to his design, but it had to be, obviously, it had to be fit for purpose. So it has a rather complicated pulley system to bring it down and take it up. And uh, we had to redesign uh, the lights. We need to, to get the cold cathode just the right color. And then this is the cockerel clock, which was, um, again, to his, to Oliver Barnard's uh, detail. And here is the room. Today it is a very successful um, uh, uh, jazz uh, nightclub. Uh, it also has burlesque music and it really is a, a, a really popular uh, place. The last room in the set of interiors is the smoking room, uh, which uh, as you can see uh, was made of, of two-toned birch wood, and uh, by the time uh, we were looking at the building, none of that striation was uh, visible. The room looked very bland, and so the columns were taken off to the workshop, and we discovered that by, because he had cut the veneer in a particular chevron style, you could actually do two different tones of uh, polish on it, and it wouldn't run into each other. So that's, you know, you sort of begin to learn the techniques because you, you wanted a darker and a lighter. So you it, this was all uh, stained in a pale polish, and then the odd one was slightly darkened, and to our amazement, it worked. And, oops, sorry. And here is the room before it was, uh, uh, given away. Uh, it had new lights. It had the, these windows are original. The, the the grills are original, but the the columns are, have been reinstated. And this is the room now, a very successful and popular American bar where you have cocktails. Um, again, run by Jeremy King. And all in all. What the Crown Estate got was exactly the sort of building that they had wanted from the beginning. Uh, a very active facade, which is over here, and you can see, and over here, uh, a, a, new, a new insert, an old conserved uh, uh, building, which from as far as the street views were concerned, maintained its integrity and the continuity with its surrounding. And, and yet it provided all the facilities that the Crown Estate ever wanted. And even though it was rent let out at the, 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 the height or the, the deepest uh, uh, trough of the recession, uh, economic recession in Britain, it was 75% uh, rented out by the, before it was uh, completed. And I think the secret of that is this combination of uh, the old and the new. And I think the, the combination of the two is uh, a win-win. And Regent Street is a perfect example of a street like that, which had always dictated, the, which had always been dictated by the market. All its development phases were designed to suit the market. It's a commercial street. But it also shows how you can change the face of a city. When uh, when um, Nash had built the, the, the street, it was uh, shops uh, with residential on the top. When it came back for retail, for, for re renovation or release in the early 20th century, it was shops and offices. And by the end of the 20th century, 
it needed to go back to residential. So it again became a combination of shops, residential and, uh, and retail, and done differently and lit differently. And, and today it is again one of the most desirable streets in London. Um, and perhaps, perhaps the historic fabric of a city doesn't all have to be treated uh, like a museum piece. Um, it, it is about keeping our cities going. It is about not um, uh, preventing uh, economic change and social change um, and commercial needs, but it's about being uh, clever uh, with how you uh, live in heritage. Um, and um, one of the mottos of Donald Insel Associates is living buildings. We believe in living buildings. Um, and, and I think Regent Street is a, is a good example of a living street um, for you all to come and have a look at. Thank you. facade was retained, where the blocks were retained, they were complete blocks that stood on their own. There's one stretch which is a retained facade, and, and it's quite clever. You have to just make the movement joints sort of function, but of course the interior has to be designed so that it lines up with the windows, and you don't have... Uh, uh, you don't have sort of uh, ceiling heights in the middle of a uh, visible in the middle of the window. It's it's a it's a it's a technical um, question. It's quite it's about movement joints. So you build your interiors with the slabs that you want to, and you clip your facade onto it, but you allow the two to move differently because your new uh, your new foundations will will shift at a different level to your old foundation. And then the well, the reason why a lot of people were shying away from regenerating is because they couldn't put their ducts through the through the ceilings, and by building the interior separately, you could find a, a route for the duct, which was not necessarily along the ceilings. So um, there are alternate, we found alternative ways. We had a slightly deeper floor where all the, the wires, the cables could be run, but we had ducts which were run in, in cores, so they don't, didn't need to run along the ceiling. So you find an alternative way of servicing your space, uh, which does not necessarily compromise uh, the sections, uh, which do still continue to line up with your windows. That's, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm just uh, wondering, with regard to Nash and his vision for the street, how much of that would you say is still intact? Mean, There's nothing left of nothing Nash's. Left. Okay. There, are, there are a few um, uh, vaults and little bits here and there, but really it's all gone. This was the difference between it coming up in the early 20th century when it was just all taken apart, new put in. And, and, and this is mostly the work of Shaw? Or, uh, all of Shaw is gone. So this is all largely Tanner, Bloomfield, uh, Wyatt, uh, Sh um, you know, Norman Shaw, it's Smirk, it, they're different architects. But the vision, it sort of generated out of Bloomsfield's vision of, of what height it should be, and that was governed by how high the shopkeepers had put their building up. So they thought, okay, this is the optimum height that would that is commercially successful, so we will go with this. Um, and so it was really quite, it was a, a commercial decision. But it was a design code that has given it that homogeneity. 
and that's how a lot of London is developed. So if you look at the Georgian squares, they have an idea of the whole, but behind each wall, there's a completely different interiors. So when Covent Garden was developed um, by the Duke of Bedford, uh, Inigo Jones laid out the square and he laid out the, the church. A lot of it is now lost, but he laid out an arcade. He knew what the building should look like. And then you had individual developers who built behind and they, they stuck to the vision, but they all did their own thing. And, and that's, that's really been the, the way uh, the, the, the London urban fabric has, has, region, has been laid out. A lot of the urban fabric has been laid out. Well, I do have the sense, though, that the street itself, the path of the street is still matches, right? Yes, 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 yes yeah. absolutely. So that, no, no, that's true, that's true. That's true. Kind of unique yes. In, in history. It's yes, still and and it is a it's a perfect um, example of of you know the whole thing of property rights. You know they unlike France they couldn't just go through a boulevard. You know that was it was not possible. So they had to do the sort of the curves and the swerves and the and and the interesting thing is that that the whole business of connecting Regent's Park to to Carlton House, Regent Street was uh, completed in 1827, and in 1827 George decided he didn't really couldn't be bothered to live in Carlton House, it never fitted him. He kept making it more and more his, but it that wasn't quite suited. He went three or four, he went to three or four architects, and then he said to hell with it, he moved on to Buckingham Palace and pulled the, the, the building down. So it was demolished in 1827. It stands here today. Uh, there is the Athenaeum Club, and then there's a, the Institute of Directors, and then there's Carlton House Terrace, which is the one that oh, overlooks yes. the yeah, and yeah. overlooks the mall. Yeah. Um, that's where it is. And there's Waterloo Place, yeah. and it's quite a grand sort of arrival but the, the it it's it's hot it's it's interesting because it empty it just has a view onto onto uh, it's, it's, uh, green park yeah I was trying to figure that out. Thank you. yeah there would have been a, a, a block at the end of it which was the uh, which was George the fourth's uh, George the fourth was a great collector of art and and Carlton house uh, was too small for him and it wasn't ostentatious enough and so he moved into uh, Buckingham Palace. So these, uh, the Regent Palace Hotel went through a huge process of consultation. Um, it's, uh, it, it is based on, it was based on a very detailed uh, historic building assessment report. So we went through all the history of the building, through every element of it. We wrote a sort of a justification of what we wanted to do, because a justification is, is weighing uh, benefit against harm. So you say, this is the benefit we're giving you, and in, in lieu of this benefit, that we're giving you, you should allow us to take this bit away. And that's basically the process, the judgment process. But in, and therefore in England, we have several bodies. We have historic uh, English heritage, um, which sort of looks over everybody onto the consultation. We have the local planning authorities, which have a conservation officer who also has a view. Uh, we also have local amenity societies, in this case, the 20th century society and the Victorian century, Victorian society, Victorian who also look after the Edwardian uh, buildings, and the 20th century society who looked after the 20th century society. So then you had the local residents who were really emotionally very attached to the building, and they really didn't want anything changed, and they weren't really convinced. And then you have the Crown Estate who really wanted to make money, basically, and that's the bottom line. And so it went through a whole, we had, even during the construction period, we had weekly, uh, we had a slot uh, for everybody to come and talk to, and the contractor would speak to them. We brought schools in, we marched children through our buildings. We have a time um, capsule put together by the school, which is buried in the building. We have, uh, we had um, everybody, you know, it was just, you know, it was sort of a, a weekly event of taking people along, showing them what we were doing. Um, it's a very tight site uh, because 
because, and so getting to it was very difficult. Um, building it is very difficult. You can't bring huge lorries and trucks in. It was noisy, so the neighbors complained. So there was a whole team that just looked after, you know, answering everybody's questions and sort of making sure that there was no noise between 9 o'clock in the morning and 12 o'clock in the afternoon and, and so on and so forth. Because it was a Briam excellent, we had to measure every piece of waste that went out. Uh, we had to see how many trucks came in, how much fuel they used. Um, it was a kind of, it was a, a big event. The building is, is was quite an expensive building. It's over 700 million pounds. Um, it has a fuel cell, the first of its type. Um, it, as I said, because they had this vision of being able to open up the area, it's 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 quite. It was quite a game changer. Um, for the whole area. We then went on to do the building opposite, which is the Cafe Royal, which we worked with David Chipperfield on. Uh, so we got quite good at this <laughs> by the end of the, of the game. You mentioned at one point when you wanted to take the building down, people got enlisted. Yes. Yes, it, it was one of the few buildings that was spot listed. So it wasn't originally on the on the listed building register. But when the when the the, the general public saw the extent of demolition when the design went to the local authority for planning consent, there was an uproar and, and the 20th Century Society and English Heritage came along and they said, what? Well, okay, now you can't do anything to it, it's listed. So it was one of these few buildings that really went through the listing process quite quickly. Um, and, and rightly so. But then they were, I mean, then we could also work with them and say, look, you either have a building that nobody uses and it continues to fall apart, or you come across, you, you, you make a compromise and you allow us to uh, take some and give, you know, it's a, basically a matter of give and take. Um, and so now they're all very proud of it, which is, which is quite nice. And we came out of it with a lot of new uh, tradesmen and 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 um, and quite a lovely building in, in the end, a very successful one. On the, on the topic of tradesmen, uh, it's so fascinating that you are taking on the role of training craftspeople who normally have that expertise. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about how your office handles both kind of cultivating that expertise in your office. And um, maybe if you've encountered situations in which um, a process or a way of manufacturing something is, is, has been sort of lost. Well, a lot of the techniques that were that are used are often lost, um, but we have the advantage over other people in the sense that we've got our books, we've got our previous experience, we've done this before, we have, you know, the 78-year-old in our office who'll say, oh yes, I remember doing it like this and whatever. So we've got, we've got that in-house sort of experience and a lot of the, and so we can, we can talk to the tradesmen and say, look, we think this is how you should do it, let's, let's do a little trial. In terms of sort of just conservation work, it's, it's, it's again experience. So we have more experience than the joiners. And I was saying in this case, the joinery firm had to be a very large one. And they called um, people, older people that had worked there to help them out. And we, we gave them some techniques. So we told them how to, to, to remove stains, how to polish, what, how to, what mixture to use in their, in their polish, and you know, how much linseed oil you put in, how much, you know, um, things like that. And which was, we were also, it, and it, it, you have to do trial runs. I don't say, didn't say that we had the answer, but we knew what recipes were. So we could give them the recipe and say, well, this is what we think it is. Let's just give it a try. And, and it's, it's this process of this exchange of speaking to them and, and, uh, and then them telling us and an old man in their shop saying, oh, yes, no, I remember my grandfather did this. And, and it's, it's this kind of conversation that really nurtures the whole process. Um, it's, it's great fun. the group in the office, not necessarily the 78-year-old group, but the, what, what 
Oh, you mean the people from our office yeah. who are working on? I think we had a team of. So how many people did Which fund? The uh, Donald Insler. Now you've got me. Uh, Donald, in when they did uh, Windsor Castle, which was 20 years ago, they had about 20 architects. Now we have 120. So there's a that's the scale of it. But we still, I mean, our our the people who were working with Donald. Yeah. Uh, including Donald himself, who's 91, still come to the office. So our, our um, knowledge base is still very much intact, um, which, is a, which is a great asset because uh, records, uh, things which are written on paper are easy to find, but things that were on the DOS system and the early computers and were just impossible to, to replicate. So. It's, you know, we're very fortunate that way. And then England has very good records. Um, Regent Street is extremely well uh, recorded, uh, both in terms of photographs, because it was not just the, the buildings, but you know, they had to build new sewers, they had to do um, new underground. There is, a, there is a post office train that runs underneath the, the Regent Street. There is a, there's a huge new sewer that was put in. So there's a whole lot of infrastructure that went in alongside that street. It wasn't just the, the shops and the, the houses. And, and, and that process was really well recorded uh, at both stages, both when MASH did it and then later on when it was redone in the early 20th century. England is very good about records, I must say. So we're very fortunate. Um, when you change the facades, Yes, 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 yes. Consultation, consultation, and consultation. That's basically uh, this is the this is really the success. And taking people with you. So we, as you said, we had lots of tours um, throughout the process, and and now it's becoming very popular. Recently, at the Royal Naval Colleges, we have a building um, uh, which has a painted hall, and it has a wonderful painted ceiling by by Thornhill, and it's being uh, restored. And and you can actually get onto the scaffold and watch the rest restoration taking place. So they will give you scaffold tours. It's become the sort of the, the thing about public access. Um, and I think that is why uh, people's views are beginning to be a little bit, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's quite interesting. One of the, the semicircular bits around Regent's Park, um, it's known as Regent Crescent, and it has these wonderful ionic columns around it, and was again a Nash building. But one corner of it was totally bombed and lost during the war, the Second World War. And it was reconstructed in facsimile in concrete, and that building is being redeveloped. Again, and we are the architects for it. And but in this case, the facade is being taken down because it was in the original, and 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 the, the facade is being reconstructed. And we got many letters saying, "Oh, look at you! You're tearing down a Nash building. Shame on you, Donald Insel Associate." And then we had to put a huge board on the front saying, "You know, pictures of it totally lost during Second World War because you know it was an original." So yes, people's memory also and knowledge is is something that we need to sometimes correct. And sometimes what they think is old and historic isn't really old and historic. So. Um, 